Hello, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to this, the second live streaming EKU Chautauqua presentation, sponsored by Eastern Kentucky University's nationally prominent honors program and housed in the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. My name is Eric Liddell, Chautauqua Lecture Series Coordinator, and I am delighted to welcome Sarah Eggie of Center College in Danville to give our presentation tonight. And also, as you see joining us on the screen are three of my distinguished colleagues from EKU, Carolyn DuPont and Jackie Jay of the EKU History Program and Lisa Day uh, from Women and Gender Studies. So I wanna thank all of you for being here this evening. And I'm really looking forward to the presentation and to the discussion we're going to have uh, at the conclusion of uh, Dr. Eggie's presentation, uh, which will take the first part of this hour, uh, after which we'll all return for that discussion and Q&A. And I want to uh, welcome the viewers out there who are joining us and uh, let them know that they can submit questions right here on YouTube uh, in the chat function. I will be monitoring that uh, throughout the talk. And uh, you can also use Twitter uh, and the hashtag EKU Chautauqua. And I will be taking a look at that as well. So hopefully I will be able to get some of your questions for Dr. Eggy in. Full details of this year's Chautauqua schedule are on our website. And you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter for regular updates and reminders. Live stream YouTube links for all of our events will be available in advance of each event on our website, as well as through those social media accounts. So once again, welcome to everybody out there joining us. If you've just you know, got here now, I'm Eric Liddell, Chautauqua coordinator, and I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Eggy of Center College in Danville, who's going to give our talk, and Lisa Day, Carolyn DuPont, and Jackie Jay from EKU, who will be joining us for the discussion afterwards. So I wanna thank the sp sponsors of tonight's event, lots of programs and departments around the EKU campus. They know who they are, uh, too numerous to list here. Um, and I also wanna thank, of course, our presenter, Dr. Sarah Ege, who is the Claude D. Pottinger Professor of History at Center College in Danville, as I mentioned. And she's the author of Woman Suffrage and Citizenship in the Midwest, 1870 to 1920, published uh, two years ago by the University of Iowa Press. And we are delighted to have Dr. Eggie here uh, virtually at this uh, virtual EKU Chautauqua to give the first of two women's history keynotes this year, because of course, Dr. Eggie was scheduled originally to be here back in March. We're delighted that she was able to reschedule and join us now. We will be having another women's history keynote in, uh, in March of 2021. And so she's going to be talking about uh, the women's suffrage movement 100 years on and commemorating the passage of the 19th Amendment uh, in uh, 1920. And it really provides uh, great context to think that only one century ago, right, was women's right to vote finally formalized in the United States Constitution. Um, and so, you know, with that uh, introduction, I'm now going to take a moment to turn things over to Dr. Ege. Uh, we look forward to your presentation and the rest of us will um, uh, drop off screen and return at the conclusion for the discussion. So welcome again, everybody. And now over to you, Dr. Eggy. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Of course, I would wish to be with you all in Richmond in person, um, but um, this is a wonderful opportunity to speak about women's suffrage um, in 2020, as Dr. Liddell said, um, 100 years after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, as I begin here, I'm gonna share my screen um, for a PowerPoint presentation that contains a number of images and sources that um, I'll be discussing. And I will pull that up here so that everyone can see it. All right. Um, so um, again, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to the sponsors of this talk. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak um, and um, on this momentous occasion, um, thinking again about this 100th anniversary, um, I often call it a commemoration uh, rather than a total celebration, although there are certain, certainly aspects to celebrate. 
Um, but there are a number of narratives that we ought to think about when we think about women's suffrage um, that help us understand the complexity of this movement. And so today I will be talking to you about um, a particular region of my uh, study, which is the Midwest, to help us um, hear another perspective and uh, integrate more narratives into the conversations that we're having about women's suffrage and women's rights 100 years out. Um, as Dr. Liddell said also, the 19th Amendment was a profound legal and political intervention um, that acknowledged that sex ought not to prevent a person from exercising voting rights. And especially as we're hearing more and more about the right to vote and how important that is in 2020, these conversations, I think, help us understand the historical context of the right to vote from a number of different perspectives, including gender. So we're gonna get started thinking about narratives first, and in particular on this theme of balance, sort of balancing narratives and how we ought to do that and how we ought to think about that. Um, scholars often narrate the movement for women's suffrage, for achieving the right to vote for women, either from like a West to East perspective or an East to West perspective. And there are images that um, we can see that capture this um, conversation. So here is one image, one map that looks at this from an East to West perspective. And here, the Western states, um, these are the states that passed women's suffrage amendments to their state constitutions earlier than those Eastern states. And this image really depicts, um, you know, liberty coming from the West, going into these, as you can see, these women in the dark colors, um, um, bringing liberty to them to pull them out of the literal trench uh, on this map. And so these Western states and their achievements uh, in this narrative are really the focus. And then out of that comes women's suffrage. So that's one perspective when we think about narratives. Other narratives look at this uh, from East to West. And we often in those narratives focus on the national movement and the national leaders in those movements. So here we have an image that ha contains two of those leaders that you've often heard about if you've looked at women's suffrage, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Um, they were closely, they worked very closely together um, and they did an awful lot of work for women's suffrage. And so their contributions, I think it's important not to overlook them, but I also think it's important to complexitize their contributions and think really carefully about what they were achieving. They led, um, what is called NASA or the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, they um, started it and then continued on um, after the uh, death of Stanton and then of Anthony, the protege, Carrie Chapman Catt continued the NASA. And so often what you, you think about there are these towering figures who picked up this movement and coordinated it from their Eastern perch um, from New York or from Washington DC, orchestrating events, um, going out into the country as necessary when there are these different campaigns, but they're sort of the nexus or the hub of this, these movements. Um, yet another way of thinking about women's suffrage and the power and the dynamics of it, but nevertheless, uh, a, a, an issue of balance here. Um, if it's from the West or from the East, we often miss um, the complexities when we think about other regions that we often uh, find overlooked. One of the, the issues that I have as I study the Midwest is that these two women and other national suffragists like them were not very fond of the Midwest and essentially wrote the Midwest out of the national story in the six volume history of women's suffrage publication that these women and other women put together. So when they wrote their own history, they then could celebrate their roles and their contributions, but also downplay the essential contributions of others. And I'm gonna talk more about why they wrote out the Midwest or at least downplayed the Midwest. But I think it's important to recognize, again, the complexities and balancing those complexities in these narratives. So one final image to help us maybe rethink narratives and, and narrative building one more time. And this is a map that I find really fascinating. Um, this map takes, I think, a much more complicated look at suffrage and not just thinking about it as the right to vote, um, full suffrage, 
but all the different ways that women could engage politically in the electoral process that weren't just necessarily full suffrage. You can see on this map, there's primary suffrage, presidential suffrage only, presidential and municipal suffrage, municipal suffrage in charter cities, or just municipal suffrage, and then all the way to no suffrage. And here what we see is a dynamism that those two narratives, the West to East and the East to West miss. That women on the ground in these states and these local lo localities were engaged in the right to vote, um, not just in the sort of overarching ways that we often think about it when we only look at these um, broad top down narratives. So that's what got me interested in women's suffrage. I come from the Midwest, it's where I was raised. And I grew up among really strong, active rural women, farm women. And when I encountered the women's suffrage movement, there was so little about the Midwest that it sort of shocked me. I thought, well, of course, Midwestern women were getting involved in women's suffrage. I even knew um, as I continued my research that there were Midwestern women in the national movement, probably the most famous is, is Carrie Chapman Catt. She was born in Wisconsin. She, at the age seven, went to Iowa and um, attended Iowa State Agricultural College, which is now Iowa State University, a co-educational institution. Um, later on, um, getting involved in the women's suffrage movement in Iowa before joining NASA. And so I knew there was this connection to the Midwest, but I also knew that the cat story was not the only story. So that's really what got me interested in thinking more broadly about the ways in which um, we tell the story of women's suffrage. Other people have done this as well, other scholars. I'm not the only one. And we know that women from a variety of racial, class, religious, ethnic, and regional backgrounds called themselves suffragists and worked for women's enfranchisement. Um, we often think about sort of the touch tones in this movement, the creation of NASA, before that, the American Women's Suffrage Association, the National American Woman, the National Women's a suffrage association before they merged in 1890. We think about the Declaration of Sentiments from 1848, um, but there've been interventions in these narratives to um, complexitize and think more critically about this narrative. Um, looking, for example, at women's groups from the 1830s and 1840s, um, starting with abolitionism, who were also advocating for women's rights even before the Declaration of Sentiments was created. Um, we also know that over time, uh, advocates sprung out of temperance, the women's Christian temperance movement, from labor and labor unions, from socialism, from co-educational opportunities and other educational opportunities and colleges and universities. We also know that women were militant. Um, they weren't necessarily following NASA's lead. And we know that there were lots of variations and varieties. So for me, that was something I really wanted to capture in my own research. So looking back at this map, for me, what's so striking is that the Midwest has diversity. You can see it in all the different ways that women were achieving uh, by this point in 1919, the year before the 19th Amendment was ratified. You can see all the different ways that women were engaging and, and gaining the right to vote, and it wasn't necessarily in the same manner. So one of the interventions that I make and, and one of the things I like to bring up is that women's suffrage was a local and state movement. And we need to think about critically those contexts to then understand what women's suffrage really was. And I think that's really important when we think carefully about ourselves and as we reflect on this 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, what it really meant, what was really going on there. So looking at the Midwest, um, even though the Midwest was sometimes at odds with NASA, and I'll talk more about that, um, they did share some similarities. Um, overall, in the United States, women's suffrage was a radical cause. This is something that we've often overlooked, um, especially thinking about um, today, so we sort of take for granted that at the time, even up to 1919 and 1920, women's suffrage was controversial. It was one of the most radical causes. People strongly opposed the idea that women could be politically independent, that they could vote outside of the coverture system or the patriarchal system in which husbands or fathers ruled um, and the family unit was really at the center of politics. 
this was incredibly radical, both at the national level and also in the Midwest. If, if anything, it was more radical and more opposed in the Midwest. So radical unpopularity is something that they shared. NASA and Midwestern suffragists also struggled with planning, with funding and fundraising, and then overcoming the reality that when they were trying to get the right to vote, they didn't just have to convince themselves and other women, but they had to convince men and male voters and male legislators and male Congress people. So those uh, realities were certainly shared by both NASA and by suffragists in the Midwest. One of the other things that NASA and Midwestern suffragists shared is that they, they worked together to develop really strong tactics and organizational um, strategies. Um, and many of the campaigns, many of the earliest campaigns and the campaigns that continued during the entirety of the movement happened in the Midwest. And I'm gonna talk about one state that really exemplifies this, um, but they honed their skills together. And that is another thing that they shared. They figured out how do we organize? How do we reach people? Um, how do we get people to understand the reasons why they ought to support right to, the women's right to vote and what messages are most effective? And so that uh, definitely was important there. They even thinking about messaging, they realized that um, persuasion and influence, so just sort of talking to people and sort of hoping that they'll come, come around, that that wasn't necessarily going to change hearts and minds toward the cause. Um, instead, they had to really focus on what arguments they were going to use. And both Midwestern suffragists and NASA increasingly used arguments steeped in white supremacy. Um, they used it to target different groups, but nevertheless, white supremacy or the idea that the vote really was for those who were most fit, those citizens who um, were desirable, those were words that they often used, both Midwestern suffragists and national suffragists. Um, white, elite, educated women were the ones that ought to have this power, and there were the, therefore others who did not. And we see this depicted often um, in propaganda that uses both Midwestern sources and national sources. So one example of this is this piece here. This is called American Woman and Her Political Peers. Frances Willard, who was the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union or the WCTU, she's a Midwesterner. She, um, the, in fact, the WCTU began in Ohio um, and she was from Wisconsin. So um, she as this national figurehead of the WCTU also had very strong roots to the WCTU. In fact, the membership uh, percentages in the Midwest were higher than any other region. And so temperance and this idea of voting the rum power out, which is often what suffragists in the Midwest talked about, was um, aligned with these ideas of white supremacy in that those people who were most often inebriated, those people who were most often untrustworthy, incapable of understanding the privileges and the responsibilities of citizenship were depicted in the ways that you see in this poster. So Frances Willard is surrounded by, um, and I've got the text there, idiot uh, convicts, the insane and Indians. Um, and indigenous populations were also quite high in the Midwest at this time as well. So Midwestern sources and images and people were often at the center of these conversations about um, um, steeped in white supremacy and these messages that were steeped in white supremacy. Um, so this is an important, I think, moment to really recognize that um, one of the issues that we have to think about here is race. In the Midwest though, unlike maybe the South or other places, maybe the West, um, the Midwest race is a kind of a complicated issue. Um, there are not high levels or high populations of um, people of color at this time, but one of the groups that is racialized and then vilified over time are immigrants. And so immigrants, if they're not on this poster, but in the Midwest, they would people would easily put immigrants in this list of people um, who were undesirable or who were um, her quote unquote peers. Um, and I'm gonna talk a lot more about immigrants, but I wanna think carefully about white supremacy and the racialization of immigrants as we think about then the right to vote and how people approached it more broadly. So we have this movement unfolding in the Midwest and nationally, and we have uh, images that we often think about when we think about women's suffrage. 
um, you probably think about these large parades in New York City, like the one depicted here from 1912, women in their white dresses, um, parading down to these massive crowds with their banners. Um, this is certainly part of the story, but as we're going to see, there are parades in lots of different places. And I think comparing them is quite fascinating and, and gives us, uh, again, a way to rebalance our narratives and think very carefully about what the women's suffrage really meant, especially in that local and state context. Uh, we also know, as I mentioned before, that there were these militant moments um, that um, often get overlooked. And so here is another classic example. Um, one of probably the most fa um, famous photographs of the women's suffrage movement, um, the Kaiser Wilson banner here held by Virginia Arnold. Um, so once again, we can see um, the, there already is complexity at the, the national level. Um, these arguments and these ideas and these images are certainly powerful, but, and, and in some ways they do intersect with the Midwest, but here is where we're going to start di diverging from the, the narrative of, of NASA and the, the national um, leaders. Um, so I'm going to put up a map of the Midwest. Uh, I know we're in Kentucky, and so some of you may have uh, experienced, maybe some of you are from the Midwest or have visited the Midwest, but oftentimes there is, I have to admit, um, kind of a void when we actually think about what states are in the Midwest. And so these are all the states that at least contain, according to the U.S. Census and other government um, agencies, at least part of the Midwest in there. So the eastern part of the Dakotas, eastern part of Nebraska and Kansas, all the way over to Ohio. So when we think about the Midwest, this is a very large region. It is very vast. Um, even today, it is very rural, and it was very rural in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and it at the, also at this time, and even today, it was quite sparsely populated, which gives it a different context. Um, so one of the things that the earliest suffragists, many of whom are from the East or the South, and they move after the Civil War to this region, one of the things they have to do is they have to literally build the settlements. Um, they come and they colonize, they take over the, the indigenous uh, land that's held um, by these indigenous communities, and they begin to build these, these structures. Um, some of the first were churches, libraries, schools, post offices, parks, um, and of course, businesses and homes. But what's fascinating is that women were on the front lines of this community development, in part because there were no municipal officials, there were no public works officials. And so these women really took it upon themselves to do a lot of this work. And I found this in my um, case studies that I've done, and it's really fascinating. Um, the first garbage collection services in the Midwest are created by women. The first public parks are created by women. Um, beautification campaigns, planting tree campaigns, these are all, they don't necessarily seem like a lot, but what they gained from that was public recognition and appreciation that they could accrue over time. Now, I mention this because it's important when we think about one of the key divergences between uh, NASA and Midwestern suffragists. As these Midwestern suffragists are doing this civic work, um, progressivism is amplifying their work and, and putting it in this category that they're cleaning up corruption or cleaning up um, unsanitary conditions. So they're, again, um, understanding this in a political uh, and context and getting further acclaim for their work. Suffer uh, NASA at this time also is producing new messages. Um, and one you may be familiar with is a message of municipal housekeeping or public housekeeping. Um, and it's this idea that women have these domestic skills that they can take from the home, like they're cleaning up their homes, they're gonna bring that out into the streets and they're gonna clean up the streets, they're gonna clean up vice because these women are so moral and they've got this experience in doing so. Suffragists in the Midwest, they, they dig this, they, they buy it but they make a really important addition to this. They sort of shift the conversation in a really important way. They say, yes, we are cleaning up corruption, but we are also responsible. Look around you at all of the things we have built from the ground up. Those spaces that you occupy, women, we raise the funds, we pass the bond issues, we, um, uh, built up public support for these things. And so we 
understand not just how to clean up the streets, but we have a responsibility now to our communities that we have demonstrated and we continue to demonstrate. So civic responsibility is an important extension of the municipal housekeeping argument because it removes the domestic part of that argument and says we are citizens. Not only are we good citizens, but we are loyal to our communities, which is key at this time, especially when we think about what's coming next. Um, a little bit of foreshadowing, World War I is on the horizon. And in the Midwest, World War I will bring a tremendous change when it comes to the narrative um, and what we think about when we think about women's suffrage. So civic responsibility is one intervention I wanna make sure that um, we think carefully about and that will continue to inform um, the conversation that we'll see unfolding in these Midwestern states. Um, I also do really think that um, by pivoting and focusing on World War I, um, it's something that we should actually pay more attention to in the, in the history of women's suffrage. Uh, I don't think sometimes we recognize enough how that popular war and the mobilization for that and women's almost unequivocal and particular in the Midwest support for the war once it um, certainly, went by the time the United States joined it in 1917, um, that really changed the game um, the rules, and it brought about um, such a seismic shift that the Midwest went from one of the places, one of the regions that was considered um, most opposed and least likely to pass women's suffrage amendments or, or bills or provisions to one that by 1918 and 1919 was passing them at the, the greatest rate, the most uh, rapid rate. So the Midwest, I think, is just fascinating. It, another way of thinking about women's suffrage, not from the East to West narrative, not from the West to East narrative, but looking at the center of the country and thinking very carefully about women, what they were doing there, and the diversity of ways that they engaged with, with the cause. So as I mentioned, um, immigrants were one of the reasons why NASA did not look favorably upon the Midwest. Um, in addition to those, American born settlers who came to the Midwest after the Civil War, there were some who came earlier, but the larger numbers came after the Civil War. Um, they often settled first, but alongside them were European immigrants. Um, now, primarily these immigrants were coming from Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, but the largest group were coming from Germany. And thinking ahead about World War I, that is going to be an important issue. So Germans will populate the Midwest in the highest numbers, um, and they will really add another layer to this question of citizenship and loyalty. Um, when we think about immigrants here as well, I, I wanna point out that these immigrants have political power. Um, in the Midwest, there were a lot of third party um, the creation of third parties at this time, populism comes out of the Midwest, the Farmers Alliance, Knights of Labor were very active in the Midwest. Later on in the 20th century, the Nonpartisan League, which is a third party that's mostly in the Dakotas and Minnesota, allows for a lot of immigrants to have political power because they operate as pressure groups within the two political parties, the dominant political parties. So they wield as a block more power than we often give them credit for, or that we would often expect. But the other thing that immigrants have in not quite all, but almost all of these states is that these immigrants, before they complete the naturalization process, they have the right to vote. Now, whenever I talk about this, people have to think about this carefully and they're usually like, what is this? What are you talking about? Isn't the right to vote a, a right of citizenship? No, not historically was it a right of, right of citizenship. Certainly women who are citizens do not have the right to vote, but we also in the Midwest see um, provisions in state constitutions that allow non-citizens to vote before they become citizens. This is called alien suffrage or declarant suffrage. And briefly, the naturalization process was a five year process. And in the second year of this process, people would go to the court, these immigrants, and they would say, I would like to become a citizen. I declare my intention to become a citizen. And in these states, 
that declaration gave you the right to vote with two years of residency in, this, in the United States. North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Missouri, Nebraska, they all have this provision. Some of them end earlier than others since these are state by state laws that allow for this. But nevertheless, it also helps us understand the political power that immigrants have. And it also helps us understand why NASA gets so frustrated with immigrants. The amendment campaigns that unfold in the Midwest, those defeats, they increasingly blame on immigrant voters whom they call uneducated, ignorant, backwards, illiterate. These are also the same words that they're applying to African-American men voting in the South, by the way. So this white supremacist argument, they're applying to increasingly immigrant men who are not supporting women's suffrage measures. Now, to be clear, it was not just immigrant men who opposed women's suffrage. American-born men did too. And these measures did not pass, not just because immigrant men voted against them, but that line of attack against immigrants grows ever stronger. And by 1914, as the world plunges into the first great world, the first world war, the great war, we start to see the nativist sentiment amplified and really electrify suffragists who realize that this is an opportunity for them to use this to their advantage. Okay, so I want to look to give you an example of how this works at one state in the Midwest, and that state is South Dakota. And here is a map of South Dakota, just so you all can kind of get a sense of what this looked like. These are massive counties, especially in Western South Dakota, the kind of squiggly line in the middle, that's the Missouri River. And so especially in Western South Dakota, those things that I talked about in terms of settlement, it's very uh, vast, isolated, long distances, lots of, of issues of trying to mount a campaign successfully in this um, place where travel is very difficult. Um, communication takes a lot of time. And so um, this is the context that, that women face, the suffragists face seven times. South Dakota had seven amendment campaigns uh, over its history from 1890 to the last one in 1918. So even though it had all these infrastructure issues, it also had a lot of opportunities and the voters had a lot of opportunities to consider women's suffrage. We often don't think about South Dakota as this hotbed of suffrage activity, but it really was. Um, by 1910, South Dakota is led by um, the South Dakota Universal Franchise League and its president is this woman, Mamie Pyle. Um, I have studied her for a very long time. Um, I find her so fascinating. She really exemplifies a lot of the um, early, or a lot of the sort of um, next generation of suffragists that came of age in the early uh, 20th century. Um, she does not have a connection to temperance. By this point, temperance and women's suffrage, NASA had done a great deal of work to divorce those and make women's suffrage a single issue. So Pyle does not have a, an allegiance to the Women's Christian Temperance Union, at least publicly. She's educated, she's elite. Um, she was herself a teacher. Her husband was a lawyer. He passed away um, at a young age, but she nevertheless continued to raise four children. And then as they got older, she decided to really throw herself into suffrage work. Like Carrie Chapman Catt, the Iowan, um, Mamie Pyle, the South Dakotan, is an excellent organizer. And one of the things that she discovers is to capitalize on these campaigns. There was a campaign in 1910, another one in 1914, and again in 1916, that to reach the voters in this vast area, she comes upon a fantastic solution, one that becomes more easily available as technology uh, improves and costs drop. And that is the automobile. And I know that this image is, is a bit difficult to see. Uh, it's taken from an old newspaper, but you can see two women sitting in their car driving um, across South Dakota. They're actually part of a huge nationwide tour, but Pyle made sure that they went through South Dakota because she realized that unlike those massive parades in New York with the white gowns and marching down for the crowds to see, those crowds were not necessarily going to appear in South Dakota or in other states in the Midwest. 
So the automobile becomes a tactic that it proves very versatile and very helpful for a lot of these suffragists. Um, but there are also parades, and I, I love to contrast thinking about the, the sort of Fifth Avenue parades and Manhattan with the South Dakota parades and other Midwestern parades. For example, this su suffrage parade um, in Kingsbury County, South Dakota, a tiny town, um, to be honest, Irwin, I don't even know if that's a town anymore. Um, I've certainly not uh, in my own travels um, visited it, but um, nevertheless, you can see the people walking down the street, um, the automobile parked there. And again, um, this expectation of, of how they can match um, what NASA is telling them and what they're attempting to do to bring the message to voters um, and hope that it will improve their chances. Now, as I mentioned, there were seven campaigns in South Dakota and the um, campaigns in 1910, 1914 and 1916, as you might imagine, all ended in defeat. And so Mamie Pyle continued to improve her tactics. Um, she did a number of different things that Kat was doing as well, carving up um, the state into districts, um, bringing out trained field workers, which was something that NASA was increasingly doing in the 20th century. Um, these people who had training and expertise in canvassing was a real benefit for people in South Dakota as well as um, other places. And so um, by 1916 um, and after the defeat in 1916, uh, Pyle is once again ready to have another campaign. And so in the spring of 1917, Mamie Pyle goes to the South Dakota State Legislature and convinces supporters there to pass yet another bill to put an amendment to the state's constitution on the ballot. And this will, the, the election will occur in November, 1918. So this is the time period that Pyle has to work with. And if she knew what was going to happen between about January, 1917, when she introduced the uh, bill in November of 1918, um, I wonder what she would have thought, frankly. I wonder if she could have even imagined. Because as, as you might be thinking, um, in March and then officially in April 1917, the United States officially declared itself on the side of the allies in World War I, fighting against Germany. Um, this was an amazing moment for the United States globally, its international presence, uh, never before had we seen this. Um, but for South Dakota um, and for lots of voters and certainly for suffragists, there was this big question of what would we do? Would we put the campaign on hold? Um, would we have a quiet campaign? Um, all of those things, uh, those questions in the air um, were resolved though. Um, shortly after the declaration of war, the governor of South Dakota, a progressive Republican named Peter Norbeck, took the women's suffrage amendment for the state constitution of South Dakota. And he added a clause to this uh, amendment. So the amendment read that the right to vote will not be denied on the basis of sex. And anyone who is not a naturalized citizen and who has the right to vote under alien suffrage or declarant suffrage no longer will be able to vote. They must be a naturalized citizen. When Mamie Pyle received word that this amendment had been uh, changed, that Norbeck had convinced the legislature to do this, she was elated because she knew that it didn't matter what she did really, um, that what she had in front of her was a moment that she would never again get. She actually privately in a letter to some supporters said, I really hope that the war lasts through November, 1918 through the election because the way we're going to mount this campaign depends on the increasing anti-German sentiment on the patriotic mobilization of women and on the question of loyalty and the responsibility that citizens must demonstrate. So she is just so excited for this. And certainly as things unfold, it works to her favor. Um, pretty soon across South Dakota, newspapers begin publishing a number of articles like the one you see here. This is one of thousands that I encountered and you could look at in newspapers across the Midwest, really nationally at this time. Um, Germans increasingly 
face scrutiny for rumors of uh, sabotage, of uh, lies, of plots, sinister plots to overthrow the government or disrupt the war, the mobilization efforts. Um, and so she and, and others really start to see all of this propaganda play into this conversation that they were having. Suffragists actually pretty early on um, and, it, and over the course of this campaign continue to build on this argument. And really they don't do a whole lot of campaigning through 1918 until we get to the fall of 1918 uh, with this amendment. It's called Amendment E and people call it the Citizenship Amendment, not the Women's Suffrage Amendment, but the Citizenship Amendment. You can see them directly connecting the right to vote for women, the disenfranchisement of these non-citizen voters, the na nativist sentiment and loyalty uh, in their propaganda. Um, here is one from 1918, although it appeared a number of different uh, places, reflecting back on the most recent campaign in 1916. Um, and again, this comes from a, a newspaper, the Press in Dakotan, um, and you can see, it, if you look, it says under, where it says note uh, under the title, the German counties are all black. Um, and the argument here, uh, I know it's difficult to read, but they're basically saying, these Germans are voting against woman suffrage. And woman suffrage is about helping the democracy. It's about liberty and upholding the principles of citizenship and rights. So these Germans are plotting electoral sabotage to deny full democratic um, provisions for women. And you see, again, you see these things coming together in this profound, very clear way. Um, and it, and it, upsets or changes uh, the, the normal kind of women should have the right to vote because they're equal or because they're responsible. And it makes it more about uh, this conversation about who is a loyal citizen and immigrants become the foil. So here, what I'm gonna show you next are a series of newspaper articles that together, I think, tell this story profoundly. Um, this is one, just the top of one, uh, calling Amendment E a patriotic act, um, talking about how the ballot guards the home. And I love that word guard. It's not just about uh, guarding the home from those uh, issues of vice or corruption or even municipal housekeeping at this point, it, the, the literal guarding, the defense, right? Sort of in this military, militaristic way, I found really fascinating. Um, another article, Women and Children Must Be Safe. Here you have a former president of NASA, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, talking about not women and, and children being safe from corruption or vice, but women and children being safe from the German impulses and the German totalitarian state. Um, and so we see another key suffrage figure talking into or speaking to this conversation, this discourse. Um, we also see partisan support for this, um, really bipartisan support, major political parties by the fall of 1918 in these different states, including South Dakota, are coming in line and supporting publicly women's suffrage in ways they had not before. Um, this was really the first case uh, campaign where they did so publicly and, and loudly. Um, and then another, the soldiers on suffrage, two to one in favor of votes for women. Once again, thinking about the way in which more war mobilization and the context of war dramatically changed what was a history of defeat of women's suffrage into an opportunity to advance it in ways that it were unprecedented. Um, one more, um, what LL bonds, Liberty Loan bonds do, um, promoting the fact that they wanted um, people to buy Liberty loans to fund the war effort. Um, I put two parts of this article in. The first part talks about the American Red Cross and all the work that they're doing and how we're supporting the war by buying these Liberty loans during these Liberty loan drives, but also how uh, it says Americans of German birth in Rice County, Minnesota are really pushed to buy these bonds to demonstrate that they are not disloyal, that they are truly on the side of the United States. 
One thing that's not in this article that I'll point out is in the Midwest, those people running these Liberty Loan drives are women. The same women who are building libraries and churches and schools are taking those talents at fundraising and community organizing, and they're running these Liberty Loan bond drives. And people knew this at this time. Now, what I didn't tell you in all of these articles that we just saw is they came from the same issue of one newspaper, the Press and Dakotan, and they were all on the same page. And for me, it's this wonderful visual representation of how all of these arguments are coming together in this profound way to challenge, upset the balance of uh, expectations of voting um, and give uh, that final push to give women the right to vote. In fact, thinking about balance, this is one of the most iconic images from the South Dakota 1918 campaign um, where you can see the circle with the different quadrants and reading it, um, what's fascinating, the words on it, cer certainly Americanism and suffrage as the byline there, but also thinking about, again, Amendment E in the middle and citizenship and suffrage on each side. And note that it doesn't say woman suffrage or alien suffrage or declarant suffrage, just citizenship and suffrage, which I think is uh, quite profound when we think about the balance there that they're um, bringing up here. So when we think about this image and we think about the final, uh, the, the outcome of this campaign, I think it really helps us rethink and reconsider those narratives that we, we talked about at the beginning here. Um, the 1918 campaign was a resounding success. 64% of South Dakota voters voted in favor of Amendment E, disenfranchising immigrant voters, non-citizen voters, but enfranchising women voters for the very first time. The seventh campaign finally brought the right to vote for women. Um, and the women in South Dakota will receive the right to vote two years before the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, so bringing this Midwestern story, I think allows us to reconsider and perhaps rebalance the narratives. I think it also helps us call attention to overlooked issues that we think about when we think about women's suffrage. What is citizenship and how does the right to vote factor into that? What is civic responsibility and how does responsibility and, and how do rights intersect and in what ways? And then also one of the big things that I'm happy to bring to this conversation is this the role of immigration and often overlooked this idea of ethnicity and the ways that immigrant groups um, became part of the a conversation for suffragists and ultimately the foil especially in midwestern states that allowed suffragists to finally achieve the right to vote um, that they had been striving for decades to to accomplish so as we are in 2020, thinking about the right to vote, thinking about voting in this upcoming election. I, I just sort of leave you with this, um, uh, thinking carefully about what the right to vote really means. And when we think about the commemorations of the 19th Amendment, certainly we recognize the profound legal intervention that the 19th Amendment created. But we also want to think about the ways in which that happened and really balance those narratives to help us really understand and appreciate the complexity that it's not just, it's also both and. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Eggy. Um, I'm assuming that you can hear me again. I'm going to start my video again as well. And I will invite uh, my colleagues, Carolyn, Jackie, and Lisa to do the same. And hopefully the screen will change here. Yes. Uh, Great. And I'm not exactly sure. There we go. I think everybody out there uh, should probably see all five of us again now. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Eggy, for that very rich and um, complex uh, presentation that certainly for me had some unexpected elements, right, <laughs> in the complicated involvement of, uh, you know, another uh, marginalized group, as, as one way to put it, right, immigrants and German immigrants in particular in the case of South Dakota. And, uh, you know, I think that you have uh, shown us how, you know, really close detailed examination of some of these um, uh, political spaces can reveal really fascinating things about um, the various alliances, about uh, 
costs, you know, to other groups and so on as political movements pursue their own interests. Um, and now I don't wanna to say too much more to encroach upon what my colleagues might want to contribute and ask. So um, with that, I will invite uh, any one of them perhaps to chime in with a question, Carolyn. <laughs> so I just um, have a comment and then a question. Um, I guess I was just moved to think about how we love to take these narratives of, of triumph and progress and tell them as a simple, virtuous movement toward progress. And of course, the people who are executing these campaigns, you know, they're just fighting in a completely virtuous way because they have some abstract commitment to some higher virtue like equality, like gender equality. And so I think that in terms of balancing the narrative, you demonstrate that it's really not that kind of pure moral quest based upon an abstract ideal. So I, I wanna just thank you for that. Uh, my question is um, my familiarity. So I had no familiarity with the women's suffrage movement in the Midwest. And I, I just have to comment that I'm from Missouri and I always found it interesting when people called Ohio the Midwest because that was back East to me. But in any case, um, I'm very familiar with the way that Southerners used women's suffrage, Southern suffragists use women's suffrage as a, an anti-African-American crusade. You know, we have to increase the white vote, but it didn't really work so well in the South. Um, but it clearly, a similar scheme worked in the Midwest. And I just, um, I just wonder if you could comment on that. I mean, um, it, it may be that, yeah, if you, if you could comment on that and why you think that didn't work in the South where it did work in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and it's something that I'm still kind of, I, I have ideas about it certainly, but I still think there's not actually been a, a, a tremendous amount of work done to do these regional comparisons. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a real untapped um, and probably quite fru fruitful field. Um, so one of the reasons I think it worked in the Midwest is that in the South, and I'm thinking primarily by the early 20th century, um, you had in the South more disenfranchisement of African-American male voters by that point through Jim Crow laws. Whereas in the Midwest, that was not happening. You had immigrants who relatively easily could vote. Um, one thing I didn't mention that um, I think also adds to this. So the federal government does not administer and oversee and enforce the naturalization process until 1906. And even when they do that in 1906, it's, it's, it takes them a long time to get this. So what often happens and I, I'm curious to know exactly how many, uh, how often this happens, but what, I, what scholars have said is what often happens is you have people who start the naturalization process, they get that declaration of intention, paperwork done at year two, and then they never finish it. Mm -hmm. And so they vote, not just for three years uh, until they get that five-year period and then they take out their certificate of citizenship, but they could vote as a non-citizen for, for decades. Mm -hmm. And so, this, I think, is the other part of this, is that there's, there's a perception that there's an abuse of the system. Now, we mm -hmm. could argue that it's the federal government who's not enforcing this and making it easy for people to do this. We could all, there are lots of factors here, right? But it nevertheless creates this perception, I think, that um, these immigrants are doing it wrong. You hear this often, mm -hmm. immigrants are not, they're not doing this the right way. Mm -hmm. And that played into that conversation, I think, in ways that made it so that when it came time to think about voting as a right of citizenship, that, that of course we would disenfranchise these disloyal, potentially disloyal citizens, these immigrants who are not doing it right. Um, and I'd also add, uh, because of the vast distances in the Midwest and the poor and relatively poor infrastructure, especially in places like South Dakota and Minnesota and others that had really not a whole lot of wonderful um, highways, the interstate's not there, right? So, um, so they could, and they did perpetuate their ethnic identities for generations. Um, so I'm, I'm from South Dakota 
Um, so that's one of the reasons I like talking about it, but I also think it has this really rich suffrage history. But I just uh, share an example. Um, so my mother-in-law, um, who's still alive, grew up speaking German and, her, and she didn't learn English until she went to elementary school. And this is in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. It's not, so I think actually, I think it helps us really think carefully about how strong and prominent these ethnic identities were. A lot of um, these ethnic enclaves had their own schools, parochial schools primarily that were associated with the churches. So they didn't have to even um, teach English. They didn't have to think about um, Americanization or assimilation efforts. Mm -hmm. And so that also becomes part of the reason why there's such a, a, a profound and dramatic shift. And then World War I just really takes that and notches it up mm -hmm. and says, no more, we're not, we're not mm -hmm. taking this. You, you mm -hmm. either prove that you're a loyal American and that means you have to be a naturalized citizen or we're gonna, we're gonna and they did, they put some of them in jail. They put some people who spoke um, out um, in favor of Germany um, in jail or, mm. or worse. So I think that is, it's a, it's a missed piece of the context often, which is I think why um, World War I and women's suffrage, I think we could think more carefully about how that context, met, like what it actually did on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. It strikes me that in, at least in the case of South Dakota, no World War I, no women's suffrage. Yeah. I've actually yeah, that's, wondered, yeah. That's the I, contingency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'll also add when it came to the ratification of the 19th amendment of the first 15 states to ratify it and they did it in special sessions and some of them they did it in the dead of winter. And if you've been in the Midwest, especially the <laughs> Midwest in the winter, you know, it's really difficult to travel and it's really cold. So they, they passed these almost unanimously um, and of the first 15 states, half of those states were Midwestern states. Mm. So you, you see it not just in this, um, the 1918 campaign, Minnesota will grant women the right to vote in 1919 for presidential campaign or presidential candidates. Um, Ohio will follow. Um, they, they have one on the books right as the 19th Amendment gets passed in Congress. So there, there's sort of this cascade. And then when the ratification process occurs, the Midwest, the, these state legislatures are just so ready to, to pass it, and they do. Mm -hmm. Thank that, you. Thank you. Go ahead, Jackie. Really well into my question. I loved your image at the beginning, the map of the West to the East, because so often we think about it as an Eastern phenomenon with Seneca Falls and Susan B. Anthony. But this year, digging into this issue, it's been really fascinating to discover that women could vote in presidential elections long before 1920 in many of those Western states. And I actually turned on PBS the other night, and it was the American Experience, the vote, and they were describing how Woodrow Wilson going into the 1916 election women in the West, because he did not support the federal amendment, women were being encouraged to vote against him. And they did not do that because they thought he would keep them out of the war. And then as you've described, once women, once, once America entered the war, women then came on board with that effort. And so I was wondering if you could unpack that just a little more and explain why so many of those Western states were enfranchising women so early. I think I've heard that in Wyoming, it was, it was an effort to reduce the power of the Native American vote among other things. So I was wondering if you could expand on that a little. Yeah, so there, has, there is a lot of scholarship on this, really wonderful scholarship. And there are a lot of arguments within that about um, were these partisan issues? Some people have argued in, in Wyoming that it was a, I can't know, I'm gonna forget which way it was, if it was a Republican governor and a Democratic legislature, I can't remember, but there was a partisan issue and it was sort of like, oh, we're gonna throw women's suffrage out there and then the other party will deny it and then they're gonna look bad, but then they actually didn't and they supported it. And so then it gets passed. That's one interpretation. Um, another is that because the West um, was more open, you had women, involved in more of these community building efforts or just um, business efforts, especially in the like ranching and mining industries in the West, that women um, had these really prominent roles and they were able to leverage those through either labor unions or the WCTU or other um, networks, uh, political networks. 
That's another argument. Um, or they wanted to disenfranchise certain groups. Um, so Native Americans is one I've seen. Um, even though that they didn't vote Chinese and, and uh, Asian immigrants broadly, there was a concern that um, if they had access to political power, that that would be a, a terrible problem. And so again, they use that in a sort of a nativist way. Um, even though they, they're in a Chinese Exclusion Act um, puts them in a different category for citizenship. So what I find really compelling, if I look at the Western states, they're, they're different. If you look at Arizona to Colorado, to Montana, to Idaho, to Wyoming, they all, women were able to build coalitions often, but those coalitions were different. Um, and the most effective campaigns were the ones where the women used the context of the state. So if the state had really um, powerful labor unions, they would go to the labor unions and they would say, hey, you want to have women have the right to vote for these reasons. And they would, or if they had a really power, powerful ranching industry, or if one political party was really powerful, or if, during populism, if populism was a really strong third party movement, they would use the populists to push the needle, that's Colorado. And so I, I find what's so fascinating about the, the West and that something that NASA didn't really like to play up is that these women are incredibly political sa politically savvy. They know, they're playing this partisan game. They are figuring out how politics works. And NASA meanwhile is saying, we are nonpartisan. We're not going to, we're above this whole fray. You know, we're not gonna enter into these. The politics is, you know, it's kind of, uh, can be corrupting. It can be. It can be a problem. But these Western women are just. They're like, no, we're gonna figure this out, and we're gonna use whatever we can. We can pull whatever levers we can to get the right to vote. Um, Midwestern women do this to a certain extent, but they're they're not as effective. Um, and this is again something that I think as more people study the Midwest, I think we're gonna uncover this in part because there aren't as many coalitions. And then sometimes the coalition, so like it, for example, in South Dakota, um, before 1910, before we have the South Dakota Universal Franchise League and Mamie Pyle, um, it was the South Dakota Equal Suffrage Association. And the same officer corps for them was the officer corps for the WCTU. And you have all these in particular German immigrants who did not want um, women's suffrage to pass because they felt like it was gonna bring prohibition. So there, the WCTU, unlike other states, like the WCTU was really powerful and, and effective in Colorado's campaign. It was not effective for South Dakota because of that particularity in the in the population. Really fascinating intersections, you know, of competing discourses and uh, fascinating senses of pragmatism, right, on the part of the coalitions you were just talking about. Um, yeah, which. I'm sure we'll continue to provide, you know, lots of detail for your and other uh, scholars' research. Um, uh, Lisa, do you have something in mind to share? Okay, and then I have a question from a student as well to get to after that, Lisa. Sure, thank you again, Dr. Aggie, for, for speaking to us tonight. And I can't wait to talk to my students about all of this. So I have a question about Mamie Pyle in particular. Um, you know, I, you, you say that she's, um, definitely educated elite and she's widowed and she's raising these four children. Um, so I'm wondering what kind of perspective that blended identity might've given her, especially in terms of any kind of communication with the indigenous populations in her area and in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she is a fascinating figure. And a lot of these Midwestern suffragists really haven't gotten their due. And so I'm glad to talk about her. Um, this is another area that is vastly understudied is the relationship with indigenous community leaders and indigenous communities with women's suffrage. Pyle certainly was um, understood. She's um, from Huron, which is kind of in the center, sort of of the state center east part of the state of South Dakota. Um, she and her husband are part of a group that founds what's called Huron College. It's not a college anymore, but at the time it was one of the, the more prominent educational institutions in South Dakota. Um, and so she's aware of these kind of creating educational opportunities for people in South Dakota. And so she encounters then indigenous community leaders who are also doing that for their own tribal um, educational um, needs. Unfortunately, though, 
I think Mamie Pyle and other Midwestern suffragists do not um, fully embrace those indigenous community leaders, even though those indigenous communities often have more um, egalitarian um, roles, they have more uh, power that they give to women in their societies. Um, there's some great work out of Minnesota, looking at the Ojibwe of, of Minnesota and how their power structures, um, suffragists actually studied that and were really curious about that. But then conversely, they didn't necessarily say, okay, now Ojibwe women, can you, can you lead us or can you partner with us? Can you take on these roles? They, they didn't do that. And I think in part, it's because of those ideas about race. I, I think that to try and convince male voters to support women's suffrage, um, that would have, been, would have been dangerous. It would have been too much. Um, and so they, they did not uh, allow those to flourish in ways that we might have thought that they were there and they just didn't necessarily do it. And Pyle doesn't really do it. She primarily sticks to other white um, American born women, some few immigrant women will join her cause here and there, but um, even though those numbers are, are much smaller in comparison to more white um, women whose families had moved in from more of the East. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, if I may, I'll share a question that um, Olivia has asked on Twitter. Uh, so uh, thank you for chiming in, Olivia. She first comments that she loved hearing about uh, you touching on all the aspects that tie into suffrage and feminism. And she compliments you saying you provided a great perspective and uh, she really appreciates how political pressure and ideological state apparatuses play a role. Um, and then she asks, uh, how do you think we could use what we know or what we've learned from uh, you know, this type of analysis of um, the fight for uh, women's suffrage? How do we use what we know about the systems to fight for equality in other forms of oppression, such as laws pertaining to gender and sex. So not about enfranchisement and voting per se, but all the other types of laws and regulations and so on uh, that um, you know, surround these types of issues and are you know, uh, being contested all across the country today. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a, such a great question. Um, and there's a really long answer, but I'm, I'm gonna just touch on it, like two things that when I think about this um, sort of resonate. And um, so the first is that I think what this story highlights is that even sort of the good intentions, the, the, the as Carolyn said, the sort of virtuous, like women wanting the right to vote, um, that good intentions are not inclusive always. Um, and so, um, in defining the ways in which you are going to achieve some goal, part of that, I think we need to really take a strong look and think about not just the ends, but the meat. Like, are we going to be inclusive? Are we going to consider the different perspectives? Are we, in this case, immigrant women, um, indigenous women in the, in the Midwest in particular, these are, are large populations and they're excluded from the, the dominant work that was taking place. And so I think, what they missed was this opportunity to actually think more deeply about voting and voting rights and citizenship. If voting rights is not uh, expressly a right of citizenship, um, then, I, then I think there's some ways in which you can apply it more broadly, that um, you can actually give it to non-citizen voters. There's, there's, there, it is still happening. Um, there are localities in the United States that award um, su suffrage um, to non-citizens. Non um, and I think it just allows you to really think about um, what is voting. It's this mechanism for um, holding your government accountable, voicing your opinion, your ideas, um, and, and having that direct line to your representatives. Um, and thinking carefully about um, then if that's the case, how can we um, make that accessible? How can we make that open? And how can we make it inclusive in, 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 as we do that? How can we make sure that we're um, building those perspectives? So that's the first thing I kind of think about. Um, I, I, in, in kind of present day, one of the places I see that is felon, felons who cannot vote in certain states. That's one thing that I really think a lot about um, is the ways in which we think about voting and, and how it's restricted and ways that we might think about being more inclusive. 
The other thing I, th I think about, um, and it's something that if you've taken a, a history, women's history class, or if you've done feminist theory, um, is intersectionality. Um, that this is really, and so many of these stories are um, grappling with these multiple identities and how they play off each other and how they intersect and how they intertwine, but then also how they might pull apart at times or they might diverge. Um, and so in that, um, just as there's, there are missed opportunities to think about voting, there's also missed opportunities for women and other groups um, and other, to think about what they share. I think frankly, like divorcing things and making things single issues or making it sort of a, a very narrow set. Um, I don't know what kind of service we're doing sometimes to the, to the work we're actually trying to accomplish. I think sometimes we, we think we're trying to make things easier, but I don't actually know. I think sometimes the complexity and the, the multiple intersecting um, identities is really powerful. It makes a better movement, frankly. And so those are the kinds of the ways that I, I, I've thought about this. Um, certainly recognizing it's 2020 and yesterday we had a um, really difficult day in Kentucky, frankly, thinking about Brianna Taylor and the decision. I just think again about how can we think about the multiple intersecting identities about gender and race and class um, and region and, and urban set spaces and policing. How do, we, how do we actually try to account for all of those things and not just try to separate them out? Um, so that, that's what I think about um, even now. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question here from Michael uh, who uh, also compliments you on this uh, fascinating view of how uh, movements really work um, and the complexity uh, of them. And he says, we often look at movements from a narrow image, but this presentation shows how regional differences uh, make for new methods. And then he asks um, on this question of uh, urban versus uh, rural that you were kind of alluding to in your comment, did the difference Sorry, my feed just jumped. Did the difference in lifestyles make a difference in East versus West suffrage? Did a heavy emphasis on ranching and farming over urban life play a role in Western suffrage? Yes, <laughs> Michael, thank you for that question. Um, so I actually came at women's suffrage. Um, I got my PhD in agricultural history as well. So I really was interested in the rural context. Um, and even though I expanded it broadly, the Midwest, even at this time was quite rural. But I do think, I think it, it mattered in terms of how they built their arguments. I think for, as I mentioned um, in these Western states, a lot of the arguments that proved most effective were really savvy arguments that talked about the economic contributions um, or the economic role. Women, especially in ranching, um, in a lot of like transportation was another field that a lot of women um, got into and, 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 and um, through their, often with their husbands. And so they could make a case about economic growth and economic development and the, and the power that women would have to also um, build economic growth, uh, infrastructure development for these places. Um, uh, good roads was a thing that a lot of farmers cared a lot about at this time. Um, at earlier in the late 19th and early 20th century, farmers had to pay for the roads that were around them. And that was a cause of friction for a lot of farmers. But nevertheless, the roads were also often under uh, in need of repair. So there was this constant tension of, of needing to repair these roads, but not really wanting to pay for them. And so suffragists actually used that in these rural contexts in ways that wouldn't have worked in an urban context to talk about infrastructure as not just an important for communication and for travel, but about growing the economy, getting your foodstuffs, your crops to markets, um, shortening or cutting down the shipping uh, times and the expenses. And so in, in many ways, I think those arguments worked really well in rural places where farmers or ranchers were attuned to those questions. If you think about populism at this time, their biggest complaints were that they were getting their shipping costs were just skyrocketing, storage costs for um, their, their grains were just astronomical and they felt like they had no recourse. And so they looked to the government to help them to try and um, regulate these industries. And that's where separate suffragists in the Midwest and the West step in and say, we want to support those initiatives too, because we're here, we care about these issues that rural America cares about. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, a couple more comments. Oh, Olivia writes back and said, and thanks you very much and says that uh, she was just talking about intersectionality in her class and really appreciated you addressing that uh, point. Um, let's see. Uh, couple other comments, no other questions. Do we have uh, other questions uh, from Carolyn or Jackie or Lisa? I have a ton of comments ton. and questions, but I am very aware of the time. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, yeah, we're at 845 now. Um, so I wanna thank you again, Dr. Sarah Eggie from Center College for uh, joining us tonight at this EKU virtual Chautauqua lecture. And thank you to my colleagues, Lisa Day and Jackie Jay and Carolyn DuPont for participating in this discussion as well. And thank you to everybody out there uh, watching us tonight. Um, stay safe, be well, think carefully, Dr. Eggie said, and go vote, right? <laughs> um, do both of those things. And uh, hopefully we will see you all back here. I think it's in two weeks time on October 8th for Stephen Alvarez who will be giving our Hispanic Heritage keynote address. You can find out all about that on our Chautauqua webpage, and you can uh, look us up on Twitter and Facebook as well. So uh, once again, with that, uh, we bid you all good night, and uh, everybody take care.